Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of The Damage Report. I am John Idarola. This is a show where we're going to talk about what is actually going on in this country and what you can do about it. Because, of course, action is far more important than words. But in terms of the words, those words will be about a number of different topics, including a new wrinkle in the uh, border crisis, uh, the fight against undocumented immigrants, which became the fight against documented immigrants, is now the fight against American citizens that the Trump administration doesn't want to be American citizens. So we'll have some pretty dark details on that. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, yesterday's uh, debate between Andrew Cuomo and Cynthia Nixon in New York and some of what I thought to be uh, slightly slanted questions coming from the debate moderators there. And then the latest information coming out of Detroit having to do with uh, lead poisoning and other forms of water contamination and how bad it has actually gotten. Later on the show, we're going to do two awesome things. One, we're going to be joined by Jermaine Williams, who is uh, in a pretty heated race for New York's lieutenant governor's position. We're going to be talking about that campaign and some of the recent attacks coming from his primary opponent. And then we're going to be talking uh, at the end of the show, we're going to do a little tour of the rest of the world. What is actually going on out there that doesn't necessarily have to do with Donald Trump, D.C. or any of that? Joining me to do all of that, Francesca Fiorentini. Always good to have you in the studio. Yeah, good to be here. Thanks for having me. Anytime, anytime. So um, before we jump into our prepared materials, I do want to give you a little update on a topic that Jared Jackson and myself talked about yesterday. So we had a shocking once-in-a-lifetime situation. An actual guilty verdict against the cop who killed an unarmed black teen in this country. Wow. Um, that was Roy Oliver, the police officer. Jordan Edwards is the um, is the, the unfortunate victim in this case. And so there was the verdict, guilty, murder. But we had a question at the time, what will they actually do in terms of, uh, you know, like, just time in jail? Will they go for parole? There was actually talk about going for, like, just, yeah, yeah, we'll watch it for a little bit. Now, thankfully, he has gotten 15 years in prison. Of wow. course, it won't end up actually looking like that. And a fine of $10,000. Huh. That seems a little bit odd. But t- 15 years 15 is years huge. It's pretty big. It's pretty big. The family is not happy with it. Obviously, they're happy that he is going to be going to jail, um, but they believe that it is not long enough. Um, but in this country, and we, we showed you the stats on yesterday's episode. If you haven't seen it, you can uh, you can download uh, that, that podcast uh, everywhere you get your podcasts. Um, is that there's no charges generally. And then even if there's charges, there's no conviction generally. So this is about as close as we get to justice as a country. And even if there's a conviction, there's no sen- the sentence is always light. Yeah. Um, but definitely not for murder. Like, that's huge. Yeah, exactly. I think that's, yeah, so exactly. 15, I mean, obviously, I miss, there's nothing that can bring this young kid back. Or, um, but this is the closest to justice. I mean, it's a, an important step. To say that police officers are not above the law, and in Texas, mm-hmm. that's that, that that's, that's true. Such a spot of bright news, honestly. Yeah, and look, if 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 this show stands for anything, it is for the quest for justice. And uh, I, I, five times so far in this show, I have said this is justice. But th- what you just said is a reminder that no, this is a legal consequence, but it's not justice. And if you if you have a little bit of t- extra time today, just read about Jordan Edwards. Read about the things that, that that have been said about him. Like, just the pictures. Like, he's he's just starting his life. Seems like a great kid. And taken completely needlessly, not because of the actions of Roy Oliver, singularly, but because of the system that we've set up in terms of our police, the incentives we've given them, the training we've given them and not given them. Mm-hmm. Jordan Edwards' death is the almost inevitable outcome, his and many others, of the system that we've set up. And the ways that we've said that you can't criticize police officers um, without criticizing the entire institution of policing. Like, yeah. no, that's not true. That there can't be justice for wrongful death or murder uh, and still support police institutions. No, yeah. we can say both of those things. In fact, they make police institutions more robust, more accountable. Yeah, exactly. And as we said yesterday, uh, I want you to look up a Real Justice Pack working to elect progressive DAs across the country. And uh, take a look. If your state hasn't had its primaries yet, there could be a chance to choose a DA who's close with the police and isn't going to do anything versus one who might actually be reform-minded. You have that opportunity in this country. Please exercise it. But let's turn now to the border, where the U.S. is apparently um, denying passports 
to American citizens along the border because they don't think that they're American citizens. And why? Um, let's keep it real. They're Hispanic. But they're saying at least their excuse is that they were, bo- they were born along the border. And there's uh, some legal precedent to believe that there is a very tiny chance that they're not actually citizens that is now being blown out of proportion to deny passports to hundreds and possibly thousands of Americans. So let's talk about how this is actually proceeding. In some cases, passport applicants with official U.S. birth certificates are being jailed in immigration detention centers and entered into deportation proceedings. In others, they're stuck in Mexico, their passports suddenly revoked when they try to reenter the United States. And again, if it wasn't clear from that graphic, every single one of these people has a U.S. birth certificate. Yep. And thus has certain rights or at least I consider them rights before reading about this story. But because they're Latino, they have to prove it yeah. with 10 other documents yeah. that no one else is asked to prove. And it. they're not accepting most of those. So there was a, there was a vet who was talking about his experience, um, who he has been denied uh, th- th- these sorts of rights. And like all of he's he's been in the military for years and years. He has all of that identification through that, all these other government documents. They, they don't want him to be considered a citizen, so they're rejecting all of that paperwork. And I think that's really important. This story is insane to me because those, so many of the people who have had their uh, passports rescinded are actually, who have, are veterans or uh, are border patrol agents. Mm-hmm. Customs and border patrol agents, these are the ones who are supposed to be venerated by the Justice Department, are now being like, nope. No, 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 we don't, we don't want you anymore. Uh, yeah. You're not, no longer a citizen. And that's absolutely insane. I will say, though, the story is super fascinating because it dates back to this whole um, moment in, I think, in what, the, like, 90s or 80s when a bunch of midwives along the border were birthing children, yay, as midwives do, mm-hmm. but also fabricating um, birth certificates yes. for those babies, which is super badass. Like, I just think that's super badass. You should never take anyone's passport away and F that, and, like, a citizen is a citizen, how dare you? But also, and I know that was illegal, but also, that's totally yeah. badass. Well, they, they did that, and that is the justification now being used to do what the government is doing. Um, because if you can say that some of these birth certificates were false, then you can just pretend that they all are. And the government even admits that the same exact midwives who were revealed to have done this, some mm-hmm. were fake, birthed thousands of legitimate citizens. And the government has revealed that it is virtually impossible to tell the difference between a fake or a real birth certificate. So I would love to see the justification in any one of these particular cases to say that they don't think it's real. You apparently can't tell the difference. And this person has lived their entire life, some of them serving, as you said, in the Border Patrol, in the military, living their lives. And now they're either locked up, stuck in Mexico. My God. Like, we've been trying to warn people now for some time. They say they care about illegal immigration. That is not what they care about. They care about race and denying certain races access to this country. And that's And we have very... I mean, I was just going to say, that's huge. When In Border Patrol, if you've been to the border uh, and you've talked to Border Patrol, many, I would say the majority that I spoke with uh, are Latino and are of, uh, have been living in Texas or along the border their whole lives. They're from the area. And that's important if you actually do care about undocumented immigration to the United States. You should have Border Patrol who can speak Spanish or who mm-hmm. identify with some of the migrants who are coming across Um but if you want just like a sort of white, like white only police force, like that, that's where they're headed uh, as if this wasn't already headed that way. Yeah, yeah. they moved so quickly from obviously they had the Muslim ban. So that was pretty blatant right sure. up front from um, we have to stop the illegal immigrants. We're going to build a wall. We'll build a dome. We'll, we'll you know, fly the, the country <laughs> off into space, whatever it takes. We're going to get away from them to now we need to shut down legal immigration to this country. Now we need to weed out these people that we never actually considered citizens. We never thought they were part of America. And if we're going to start at the border, if we have to, we'll start there and then we'll move inward. From a personal point of view, um, my girlfriend was born literally a mile from the border, Mm. maybe two miles, in Texas, in the valley that's being targeted right now. She has to travel abroad sometimes. She works as an actress. Sometimes she has to shoot in other countries. There is no reason to believe that she will not be one of these people now. She's lived in this country her entire life, Mm. gone gone to university, everything. But will it matter with this government, this white supremacist government that we have right now, that we were told not to worry about, it's the same as every other government, doesn't matter who's actually in power. We're told it's all the same, but they're stripping citizenship from American citizens because of their racism. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Unf***. 
The Republic, or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un*** the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. That's the situation we have today. I don't have a solution right now, by the way, other than, I suppose, getting these people out of government. I think you need to have a baby, John. I think that that's that anchor baby gone. I mean, you know. We'll work on that during the break. Um, I'll call her up. Um, But anyway, no, it's just a frustrating situation. (laughs) It's awful. And thankfully, people are talking about it. But even even a historic, terrible situation like this, people have some fatigue over issues at the border, so it's not getting talked about nearly as much as it should. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, though... Uh, the debate in New York, uh, Andrew Cuomo versus Cynthia Nixon, it got fiery at times. And then we move on to uh, poisoned water in schools in Detroit after this. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone, to The Damage Report. I am John Adarola. Francesca is in studio as well. Very excited about that, especially because we're now turning to the big debate in New York. Andrew Cuomo, Cynthia Nixon... Um, we've got a, a couple of little excerpts we want to get to, but I, I want your opinion first. Mm. Uh, you saw it. What was your impression um, of how it went down for each of them? Um, I thought it it went well for Cynthia. I thought it really think it did. did. I think it okay. went well for her, except for like one or two zingers that were like, ugh, you know. From her or at her? From from her, actually, that I thought kind of fell flat, to be totally honest with you. I could have like helped her punch it up. But <laughs> I thought that it was a very typical sort of establishment, very entrenched um, politician, Democrat, taking aim at Trump multiple times um, when he, in fact, has a contender coming at him from the left and sort of saying, you don't know what you're talking about. Calm down. We're going to do X, Y, and Z. You don't know what you're talking about. And she got very, very, very specific, and he wasn't able to go into specifics with her. Or didn't want to. or And didn't want to, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so that was, I think, the most interesting sort of narrative part of it was that he really came at her, like, hard. You think so? Yeah, I think so. I, I think in a fairly dismissive way in mm. some cases, like I found it to be somewhat condescending at times. I mean, obviously she's aggressive as well. Like that's obvi- that was always going to be a part of her strategy, especially because you are the challenger. You have to be like that. It, it's not uncommon in these sorts of situations for someone like Cuomo to just present himself as, you know, the, the I guess, the venerable politician. Like I'm going to be the respectable one and look at this upstart. But it's New but York. Really atta- yeah, that's true. It is New York and he really, he did attack her. Um, now he is, I would say, amongst Democratic governors, one of the most open to attack, considering not just issues specific to New York City, but his interaction with the New York State government, which we've, we've previously had uh, Namiki Constant to talk about. Like his history is dark. even with Trump, he served as Trump's lawyer at one point, Absolutely. and then there's all the weird corruption stuff. You know, we've we've, we've gone on and on about that on, on the show, um, but he really did come at her, and and I wonder. He, even having the debate at all probably indicates that she's doing better than he would have hoped that she did. Do you think that attacking her in this fashion, attempting to show that she either doesn't understand these policies or can't explain how she's going to pay for them or whatever, you know, the standard sort of thing, is that just a Cuomo sort of strategy and York sort of strategy? Or do you think that they have more internal polling and it's pretty close? That this is going to work for him? I think that— Or why he would do it in the first place. I think it works— 
I, I mean, obviously, and it, he spent a lot of time bashing Trump. Trump the whole time and said, I'm the guy who can, you know, um, take down Trump, 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 and then turned around and proceeded to kind of act exactly like Donald Trump mm -hmm. when bashing uh, Cynthia Nixon, kind of saying um, bullying in a way. Um, and I think that is what a lot of progressive uh, contenders are going to have in the Democratic Party, and that's important. It's important, I think, the one missed opportunity for her was to say, hey, this is actually, of course I'm against Trump. But, like, in fact, here's how you've laid the path for more Republicans to have more mm -hmm. power um, who support the president. Yeah. Um, and, and in particular gave Republicans more power inside of the New York state government. Exactly. But I think in terms of New Yorkers and bullying, like, every New Yorker respects a bully. And that's messed up. But you mm -hmm. do. You're just sort of like the person who gets walked on on the sidewalk. You're like, eh. Social Darwinism, bop, bop. <laughs> like, no, so, so I thought Cuomo did a good job in being that sort of like, you know, gritty New Yorker. But also she pointed out that that also was like the grittiness of just corruption. Yeah. Yeah, and of, of having been in government for far too long and not like some politicians are sort of tainted over time, but some like just hug the taint. <laughs> Just gather it to Ooh, them. I don't know if we should they repeat just, that. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. the, the metaphoric taint yeah. in this particular case. Um, I thought she did a good job of laying <laughs> out some of the opportunity cost of having Andrew Cuomo, um, causing people to, like, hey, maybe he actually hasn't been doing anything. Maybe this is a powerful position where you could actually advocate for policies that benefit regular yes. New Yorkers and don't just continue the same yes. sort of thing while talking about D.C. Like, yes, that's a part of it. But you are the governor, obviously. New York is what you're supposed to be focused on. No, and I thought that was so good. I know you're going to get into specifics, but exactly. Like, the fact that many Democrats who sit around and they don't necessarily pay attention to what's going on in inside the state, they don't know what Cuomo's doing, they just, know, they just know he's a Democrat. I think Cynthia Nixon and her whole campaign have done a good job to unearth, hey, mm -hmm. this is where money hasn't been spent, like the MTA. This is how you've mishandled right. uh, the state Senate. Like, this is how you've handed more power over to the right. And Democrats otherwise might not be paying attention to those issues. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully in this cycle they are. Uh, I want to play one of the videos because this is a question that I've, not a question, there's a question in the debate that I've seen play out on Twitter because our debates have apparently now just become Twitter threads. Right. Um, so here's a question from the debate moderator uh, to Cynthia Nixon. Will you forego the governor's salary of $179,000 and turn it back to the state? Sure. No salary. No salary. Maybe a dollar. Maybe a dollar. Okay. Um. Now I would love to play for you uh, Andrew Cuomo's reaction to that question. But they didn't ask him that question. They only asked Cynthia Nixon that question, which seems a little bit odd. And as many people have pointed out on Twitter since then, and before, honestly, because this is something that comes up constantly. If, you, if Bernie says he's a socialist, why doesn't he give away every dollar he has? Uh, that socialism or democratic socialism are not a vow of poverty. <laughs> they don't mean that you you, for, you renounce all material goods and you don't care about that. Yeah, Jesus just think, already did that. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's the other guy. Um, all it is is saying that the relationship between the government and the economy should be one that benefits actual people, the working people, not simply the most the the most powerful, connected, and richest people in society. That does not mean that you cannot become wealthy. In fact, we believe that it is a system that will produce more overall wealth for more individuals and certainly across the entire economy. Right. And so it's a stupid, condescending, naive framing question is all that it is to me. No, of course, it's just kind of trying to goad her into being like, yeah, so you, and she doesn't actually say that she's a socialist. She doesn't come out, right? She, she. Uh, My impression is that she does, or a democratic socialist or, I don't or whatever. Know we'll, we'll, we'll look it up. Yeah, we'll look into but that. But certainly she is a very strong progressive and, and in particular sure. on economic issues. So she is, she is close to that positions wise, regardless of whether Meanwhile, your contender has raised the most money uh, from so many like unnamed sources and the most, in the yeah. largest, pack ever in terms of a governor race, will you renounce $180,000 yeah. a year? Like, Yeah, and she said that she would. She never should have been asked that question. I don't know exactly how she should have answered it. Um, I might have responded by saying, eh, that's an insulting question. Let's move on to the next one. Maybe. To be totally fair, like 179 sounds like a fair governor salary. Like That sounds like so much money to me. Yeah, right. Well, I understand your governor. No, it sounds like a lot. It also sounds like a little, mm -hmm. um, depending on who you are. But I'm like, yeah, like you could maybe live in San Francisco for, on, on that salary. <laughs> wow, that or is, that is New a high York. bar. That is a high bar. Yeah. Okay, let's turn to a different city, though. Let's talk about Detroit because uh, apparently schools in the Detroit public school system will not have drinking water. 
just in general, all of them, no drinking water, after tests showed increased levels of lead and copper in the water. And the reason there was uh, tests showing increased levels of lead and copper in the water is that there are increased levels of lead and copper in all of the water all over the place. And they just happened to run tests there, wow. which is nice because now we know that it's there. So uh, the superintendent of Michigan's largest school district is Nikolai Vitti, who uh, ordered testing of all schools this spring after tests back in 2016 found elevated levels of the metals that we've been talking about. And the initial results of 24 schools found 16 have levels higher than acceptable. By the way, we've talked about those acceptable standards before and how unacceptable those standards are. But um, they tested all different sorts, and there will still be water for hand washing and toilet flushing. Although as you're uh, flushing that toilet, bear in mind that it's filled with lead. And so this is obviously horrible because if they're stopping the drinking water now, I have a feeling the lead was there before, Mm -hmm. and they were drinking it. And apparently tests showed two years ago that it was there, Let's get around to some tests in 2018. That seems a little bit irresponsible. Just schools, though. That's just where, like, kids are developing. You know, mm-hmm. they, like, shed all their cells quicker than I do, um, <laughs> than we do. I have a question, though. My The school in my water, the water in my school, mm-hmm. it's early. It's a boat school. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Tasted like number two pencils. Well, that sounds that very sounds much like, like lead. That sounds like lead. That sounds so much like lead, No actually. wonder I just said the school in my water. Yeah. Probably, yeah, because, of course, we know that as bad as lead is for everyone, it's Dude, particularly bad it's for developing brains. it's that number two pencil water. Um, okay, we, we do have to take a short break. When we come back, a little bit more on how we got to this point in Detroit and, and a wider look at how bad this problem has actually become after this. Hello, everyone. So much still to get to, but I want to talk a little bit more about lead. Uh, before the break, we were talking about uh, the Detroit public school system which is just not going to have drinking water because it is so filled with things like lead and uh, copper. Um, Now, in response to the testing results that we talked about in 2016, uh, one expert at Cranes Detroit said that such water contaminations could be found nationwide wherever school authorities spend the time and the money to look. And the only reason that we don't know about more of it is because they don't do these sorts of tests frequently. Um, Any grade school kid will tell you, you don't drink from the water fountain because it tastes like number two pencils and it's gross and it's like lukewarm. Yeah. Uh, and like half the time it goes in your nose and like you don't really know how to slurp yet. You're just you're just getting over the sippy cup. Yeah, there's a number of different issues that you're really, that are combined there. Yeah, yeah you're like Pepsi Physical problems, or but. nasty copper water. Yeah. yeah, and so should we be surprised that there's so much pickup of sodas in schools? But again, just to, to, to clarify, and everyone should know this by now, Uh, Lead is not just a problem. It is a permanent problem. It permanently affects your level of intelligence, emotional development, all of that stuff. So the people who can least afford to be drinking water contaminated with things like lead are exactly these kids who are affected by this. Mm -hmm. Um, But also, an investigation by PBS's Frontline found that contaminated water in Flint may have killed almost 10 times the number of people as the official count currently indicates through a rare form of pneumonia. And generally... When we talk about the people who died in Flint, we talk about the outbreak of Legionnaire's disease. But that was not the only thing killing people, nor, of course, the only thing affecting people uh, in, in you know, long term. Um, but in terms of how Detroit is going to deal with this problem, we have a little bit of information about that. Back in June, Michigan enacted new regulatory measures uh, to mitigate these water crises by replacing service lines, the nearly 500,000 lead service lines that we still have today in that particular area. But that's not expected to even start until 2021. The replacement of Flint's own pipes is expected to take another two years. So this is a situation where it is going to take a very long time to get it done. We're not even starting now. So they're going to turn off the drinking water now. Is it going to be resolved in a week, in a month, in a year? Is there never going to be drinking water again for the rest of these kids' time in school? That's what it's looking like at this point. Um, You know, the libertarian hellscape that we currently live in says, whatever. We don't need public drinking water. We just, and like, you know, we don't need these lines. Uh, Why don't, maybe like Bezos can sponsor them or something. Yeah, Yeah, and the thing is, like, obviously dealing with the sort of the the situation we have in terms of the lead service lines is a huge problem. John Oliver did a great breakdown years ago on the cost of replacing all of them. Um, And it is a lot of money. And it is a fraction of what we spent on the tax, tax cuts that we had earlier this year. Or any number of other things that we spend money on. Like, we can say it's a lot of money, it's complicated, it would take a long time. 
okay, we're supposed to be a great country that can accomplish great things. Let's do it. And you know what? After we spend um, hundreds of billions of dollars or however much it's going to cost and years of literally employing people to do this, we can then sit back as a country and say that we accomplished a great thing. We had a huge challenge facing us. We met it and our kids are better off, not just immediately, but for the rest of America, Mm -hmm. they will be better off. This is an opportunity that has been presented to us, and instead we're taking not even half measures and half steps. We we haven't put our shoes on at this point. Maybe in 2021 we'll slip our loafers on, and then we'll start to do something about this. But we've been talking about this problem for as long as I've been in media, and we're still shutting off water for schools. We haven't moved at all on it. And we know the solution. It's not like... Hmm, well, maybe if we do job retraining and if we... No, just take the lead out of the pipes. That's the solution. It's super simple. There's poison so in the pipes. To take it out. But blame people, John. It's just so much easier to blame people for their own problems, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then not give them health health care when they have actual, you know, health needs. Yes, I, bl- I blame the pipes. Yeah. I think that they're asking Drink for it. Drink more Gatorade. Yes. Okay, can we, can we turn to something else in schools, actually? Because uh, lead is not the only thing um, uh, potentially uh, destroying our schools. Uh, Betsy DeVos also is. She's education secretary, so she is there to destroy schools. And uh, obviously, we know there's a huge problem with uh, sexual assault, sexual harassment at colleges. And colleges generally have not taken it very seriously. Well, now, finally, Secretary DeVos has new regulations that will have the force of law having to do with sexual harassment and sexual assault claims to defend the rights of the accused. That is literally what Mm -hmm. she's doing. She's going to make it harder for uh, claims of sexual assault and sexual harassment to actually have any consequences for those people. These rules will narrow the definition of sexual assault that schools are required to adjudicate, meaning they will be free to do less in more cases, and will restrict eligible cases to those that occur on campus. So if one student rapes another student a mile away from campus... What can you do? Who cares? They can go to school together again. Yeah. Uh, That's great. Thank you, Betsy DeVos. It will also raise the burden of proof used by schools when adjudicating the cases with schools permitted to choose between two legal standards in determining an accused student's guilt, which is, of course, important because it's an area where we know it's incredibly difficult to prove virtually anything. But uh, previously, they were allowed to use a preponderance of evidence standard. Now it will have to be closer to actual legal guilt being established by schools that are ill-equipped to actually investigate this. So the result of these policies appear to be that more people will get away with rape. Yeah, um, I mean, this, maybe I'm being unfair. I don't know. I think you're right. I think the to- topic is complicated, and I like don't know enough or all about it, and I'm interested. I, I have. First of all, of course, this is in a long line of ways that the Trump administration just protects the powerful. Like, um, how can we, like, help the aggressor a little bit more, you know? And this is just one of them. And Betsy DeVos went around and listened to uh, the mothers of probably wealthy students who were expelled and whose mothers have always done their homework for them and now their son was accused of rape and they're going around and saying that my son was wrongfully accused, et cetera, et cetera. Um, This is a minority in the amount of unreported rape cases and assault cases that happen on campuses every single day. So let's just take that into consideration that the number of wrongly accused is minuscule compared to the people who have not even reported their rapes or are too afraid to, because they know, for example, that until there was this expansion under Title IX, uh, that there was no recourse on campus. That being said, I know that the Obama administration's expansion of Title IX, which I think was not necessarily the right way to go about it. I didn't, I think that conflating gender discrimination or gender equality on campus, which is what Title IX protects, Mm -hmm. and rape uh, was a dangerous act, and I think mm-hmm. it has conflated this idea of protecting, um, you know, gender equality on campus and like being safe from assault. And I think all people can be assaulted, um, and I think those things should have been separated. And I mean, I know that the restrictions or the new regulations that the Obama administration put in were broad, mm-hmm. and maybe didn't have enough steps to help campuses get from and schools get from um, a complaint. And to like a, a due process, basically, right? So that is very real. That like maybe the the former administration didn't actually fully equip schools in a way where they could adjudicate these things um, without just sort of blanket being like, I don't know, expelled. Uh, I don't know, expelled, expelled, yeah. expelled. So that is absolutely something that should be revisited and bettered, but not by just making it easier to sort of sweep this under the rug. 
In fact, we have to hold universities accountable, give them the tools to do this, not just say, hey, if you want to do it or not, or yeah. hey, we're going to lessen what the you know what constitutes rape or what constitutes um, you know uh, rape on campus. Meaning, if it's again a few blocks away, it's not. If it's at a party, it's not on campus. Um, yeah. I think they're going about it the wrong way. I, I agree. Um, it, it seems like these rules are designed to make it less likely that universities will actually pursue dealing with the case, and more likely that the case will result in more action. And we've, you're right, the, the percentage of rapes that are reported is obviously far smaller than the number that aren't. That number has started to get a little bit closer over the past decade or so because people feel a little bit more confident that if they say something, something might happen. Right. And a little bit less, like they will personally be demonized for talking about it. And especially with the Me Too movement, there's more respect for, for people's struggles and, and, and all of that. I'm going to make a bold prediction. This is going to help separate those numbers again. Yeah. Because what is the point of going through all this if now it's even more unlikely that nothing positive will happen? You'll have no justice. You'll have to continue going to class with your rapist who is now better protected under the law thanks to the efforts of Betsy DeVos. Right. It's and not that is like exactly a- not the direction we're supposed to be going in. Like, I mean, listen, unless we see a recommitment of money, like I want to see money for training and programs. Some uh, sort of incentive or responsibility on the part of universities to take it seriously. Exactly. for To take it seriously and to put into – like put into place systems that don't just say guilty, innocent, guilty, innocent, but also like can do a thorough investigation and obviously not wrongfully accuse people, help victims feel safe to come forward, all of these things. But without money, without actual plans, all of this is really just a hat tip once again to aggressors. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we are going to take uh, one more break. Um, we've been talking about the governor's race in New York. Of course, there's also a lieutenant governor's race, and we are uh, pleased to be joined by one of the progressive challengers in that race after this. In the show, we were talking about the uh, debate between Andrew Cuomo and Cynthia Nixon. Obviously, the governor's uh, race in New York, incredibly important. But right up there, too, is the lieutenant governor's race. And we've got a Democratic primary coming up in not that more many weeks. Um, we are joined now on the Damage Report by Jumani Williams, a candidate for lieutenant governor of New York. Very excited to have you on the show. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much. It's exactly two weeks to be here, as a matter of fact. Exactly two weeks. So that, that is coming up soon. And uh, so I've been you know, doing research on your candidacy, and you said a number of times that you have a, uh, a quote, different vision for the lieutenant governor's office. So uh, you're going against a Democratic incumbent. How does your vision differ from hers? Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm, going, I'm running in a Democratic party because uh, I for Democratic primary, because I believe any blue just won't do. Uh, the current perception of what the job has always been was basically uh, an expensive rubber stamp office or an expensive ribbon cutting office, basically just doing whatever it is the governor says to do or allows you to do. I fundamentally believe in a different vision. I believe that that office should be a partner uh, with the governor, obviously, when they are doing the people's work. But when they're not, when the lip service is different than the actions and people are suffering, someone has to step up, step out, and say the emperor has no clothes. Uh, the current lieutenant governor believes they're the eyes and ears of the governor. I want to be the eyes, the ears, and the voice of the people of the state of New York. And that's why I'm wanting to be the people's lieutenant governor. You know, so it's interesting. You're talking there about the relationship between the governor and the lieutenant governor. So you, you had a, a debate recently against Kathy Hochul, the, the current incumbent. And in that, she was asked if she could recall a time in which she had changed Cuomo's mind on an issue. And she said that she could not come up with an instance of that. Um, If it had been you these past few years, how do you think that would have played out? Do you think you would have had a better shot? That absolutely would have played out differently. It would have either been one or two policy areas that I definitely could say, this is where I had an impact and change of mind, or... This is where I did the best I could to make sure the people's voice was heard, and it would be a palpable way of demonstrating that. That's why we have to have a different type of vision for the office. Uh, I'm I'm shocked, frankly, that since I've been saying this, uh, the current lieutenant governor hasn't changed her position, but she's sticking to it to make it basically a primarily ceremonial role. Uh, Just to be clear, uh, in the Democratic Party primary here in New York, they specifically allow you to run independently uh, from the governor. And I think they did that for a reason. They wanted to make sure that, yes, you are a partner, but not a rubber stamp. 
uh, and when there are disagreements, which there will be in, in government, you're not beholden to the legislature, you're not beholden to the uh, governor, you're beholden to the people that you represent. And you know, it's interesting, uh, obviously, that the relationship between those two is different state to state, and, and, and you rightfully point out that the independence uh, there in New York is an important part of it. Um, but I've been looking at how she's been campaigning, and I haven't seen too much focus on what she hopes to accomplish if she's reelected. But in terms of you, she said a few things that certainly stood out that, that perhaps you can respond to. Um, she sent a fundraising email recently that referred to you as just a, quote, charismatic young black man. Uh, what, what, how do you respond to that? You know, it's, it's sad that that's where we are, and you have people who are calling themselves part of the resistance, part of them calling themselves activists. Uh, it's interesting. I was always told that I had to choose between being an activist and an elected official. I rejected that, and I adopted both. In 2018, people who can't even formulate what that means are trying to say that. Uh, and we have people who are saying they want to fight Trump while adopting the same tactics, unfortunately, that is used in the South. They're much more blunt. So in Florida, someone uh, might be called a monkey. In the North, they've always been much more sophisticated with their dog whistling. So they might just surmise my entire career uh, being ranked the most productive council member in a 51-member body, passing almost 50 pieces of legislation, the most of any city council member, to simply a charismatic young black man that people should be afraid of. Yeah, well, they are more subtle, but I think people still got the message. So I wouldn't worry too much about that, unfortunately. Um, so uh, in addition, she has uh, tried to attack you with references to your personal financial debt, which strikes me as an odd thing to use as an attack, considering how serious debt, uh, the debt crisis has become in this country. So uh, how, do you, how do you respond to that? It was interesting. I have been saying I'm, I'm running against a uh, establishment Democrat who's a millionaire, uh, and kind of living in a bubble. And lo and behold, I get attacked uh, about my debt, which uh, kind of just proved the point. And actually rehashing things that I've been very open about, uh, having to deal with a, a foreclosure, uh, with a, a business that failed. Uh, thankfully, we've been able to work down some of that debt. Um, and basically, she said that 75% of New Yorkers who are dealing with debt uh, would not be eligible or should not be eligible to run for office. And so that was an interesting uh, claim to make. I have been a very good steward of the people's money uh, in New York State, uh, whether I was running nonprofits statewide or as an elected official. The current lieutenant governor actually has not. There's been a lot of corruption. There's been something called a Buffalo Billion, where the lieutenant governor and the governor received large contributions from people that they then gave almost a billion dollars to. And that gentleman and others are actually going uh, to jail now. But we see these kind of attacks again on specific kind of candidates, uh, whether it's Stacey Abrams in Georgia or myself here. Uh, there are certain kind of candidates that usually get these types of attacks. Again, it's dog whistling around race and class. That just showed the current lieutenant governor uh, not only is out of touch, but doesn't want to get into touch and basically wants to use the fears of people uh, she believes will react negatively uh, to this. Uh, oh, sorry, will react in fear to this uh, to come out the same way they came out for Donald Trump. Yeah. Well, that is certainly, uh, I understand that that's the sort of thing that's going to happen in these general elections uh, lately. It, it's sad to see it happening in Democratic primaries as well. Um, one final question for you, though. Uh, obviously, this, let's say you, you become lieutenant governor. You might be either working with Cuomo or Nixon, um, depending on which, go, you know, which ends up in office. Uh, how do you think that's going to impact your ability to achieve your goals in the lieutenant governor's office? Well, I, I do want to say I, I, um, I happen to have a lot of identities. I, I am a black man. I have Tourette's syndrome and ADHD. People may say me uh, shake a little bit. I am a public school baby from New York State, from preschool to master's. I was raised by a single mom, raised two knucklehead children by herself. I'm a first-generation American. My parents are immigrants. Those kind of identities are under attack. But more than that, my vision for this office, uh, the history that I have on the city council of productivity uh, combined doesn't change what I want to do with whomever the governor is. As a matter of fact, if the current governor actually believed in things he was saying, I'm the type of lieutenant governor he would want to get it done. Thankfully, Cynthia Nixon, who I've endorsed, does agree with my vision of the office. That's why we have uh, cross endorsed. And again, my job is not to be adversarial or an obstructionist. My job is to work in partnership to productively get things done. Where that is happening, 
everything is great. We just keep moving along. Where that is not, you first try your best to work something out with your partner in a room. Uh, if that can't happen, the job that I have is to make sure I'm letting people know what is going on yeah. and that I have their back and their ears and their voice. And if you have to do that publicly, you have to. Uh, I have a history of having the courage to step out when other people would not. And that's what I want to do in the lieutenant governor's office. In the New York City New York City area, we have something called the public advocate. Basically, uh, it's not connected to the legislature or the executive. There's nothing like that in Albany. And, I, and if people read about what's happening in Albany, we can see that the state is suffering because of it. Well, uh, Jumani Williams, uh, candidate for lieutenant governor of New York, Democratic primary coming up on September 13th. Uh, thank you for joining the Damage Report. Thank you. Please go to JumaniWilliams.com. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram as well. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break, come back, a little bit more for you. easy to get caught up in our own bubble and forget that the rest of the world exists. So to try to fix that, we're launching our new segment, Meanwhile In. <music> Lovely music. So meanwhile, in Japan, the first ever female fighter pilot in that country has just finished her training. Uh, here is a picture with her looking like a complete badass. Yeah. That is Misa Matsushima, who said, Ever since I saw the movie Top Gun when I was in primary school, I've always admired fighter jet pilots. As the first female fighter pilot, I will open the way. I would like to work hard to meet people's expectations, show my gratitude to people who've been supporting me. I want to become a full-fledged pilot, no different from men, as soon as possible. That is badass. So badass. And obviously this is a country that has its own particular forms of you know, gender discrimination and difficulties and stuff like that. And every military, aside from perhaps Israel, has huge problems with integration of women into combat roles. So this is a big step for Japan there. Yeah, next step, Scientology. <laughs> there you go. We're going to be working gun. on that next. We're yeah, gonna be working on that. oh, that's a good on point. It, girl. We're going to be working on that. Uh, okay, so where are we headed next? Pacific Garbage Patch. I love the patch. I love. I visit there at least once a year. Mm -hmm. A uh, massive ocean cleanup project aims to cut garbage patch garbage by ninety percent by twenty forty. We've talked about this before, actually. The ultimate goal of the project, founded by Dutch inventor Boyan Slot when he was eighteen, is to clean up fifty percent of the patch in five years, and then again ninety percent by twenty forty by using these gigantic floating booms to uh, sweep the garbage up for collection because it's distributed over a huge What do you say, area. booms? Booms, basically, these big booms. So it's a giant, like, Swiffer? Just basically like, a boom. huge ocean Swiffer, and he was a teenager who came up with this, and now they're, they've got prototypes in the ocean, and they're going to be deploying it soon, hopefully. As big as the continental United States. It is 1,000 miles. Oh, really? I think so. It's huge. Uh, and uh, in fact, by the 2050, by 2050 or the 2050s, oceans are expected to contain more plastics than fish, which is yum. not cool. Not cool oceans. Not if we know how to cook it right. <laughs> exactly. Okay, uh, where are we headed next? <laughs> Let's stick on the invite. What's up? It's just, it's just very reading rainbow. I'm going to say, bit. John. I like it. I like it. Boop, 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 boop. There We're are other countries out there. <laughs> there are. Uh, France is one of them, but we're going we're gonna to move to France and stick on the uh, environment because their environment minister was doing an interview and he resigned his position live in the interview because of the lack of action of the Macron government on the environment. Uh, this is Nicolas Hulot who said, I do not want to lie to myself anymore. I don't want to give the illusion that my presence in government means we're answering these issues properly. And so I've decided to leave the government. And he cited some areas. Um, they haven't done anything on pesticides, erosion of biodiversity, the artificialization of the land. The answer is no, no, no. Or, you know, in French, um, non, over and over. They're not doing enough. And so he has resigned. Uh, bleu. That is. <laughs> it's good to so say. It's we always, need that. It's always sad when people in government resign. They're like, I just can't be useful. And you're like, you're in government. Yeah, Aren't but they you? still require the, you know, Macron's yeah. got to go along with of it, I suppose. Of course they need resources, but you know things are bad when yes. people who are appointed to carry out, like, you know. I agree. <laughs> these very changes are like, can't I can't it. carry out these changes. Can't do it. <laughs> so uh, one more location I think we have time for. Okay, meanwhile in Scotland, great move uh, to address the issue of, uh, they're saying the scourge of period poverty. They're the first country ever to make sanitary products free for students. 
That is great. Girls in a lot of parts of the world uh, miss out on school because of access to these things or have to use something else in place of it. Good move, Scotland. You've done good. But we have no excuse to get out of swim class now. Not at all, unfortunately. Um, yes. Okay, well, thank you very much for joining us. You're actually going to be you. on the program tomorrow. Yeah. So stick around for that. We're going to have a, a great show for you on Friday. Thank you for watching. If you haven't already subscribed to the podcast, go to wherever you listen to them. Go subscribe. And we'll see you tomorrow morning. Thank you for listening to the Damage Report podcast, the show covering the true threats facing our country and what you can actually do about them. You can support this free podcast by leaving us a review and giving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or wherever you happen to be listening to it. Every review helps more people discover the show at no cost to you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.